Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we've got Lorde Ariola with us today. She is the founder of Linkenium. Uh, we're back in South America for our second week running. This time we're in Mexico. So welcome, Lorde. It's really great to have you with us. Can you explain to us what it was that, that got you interested in the topic of diversity and inclusion and, and how you came to, to found Linkenium? Hi, Mel, Debra, and Antonio. And nice to talk to you guys. Uh, well, yes, I got interested in this um, topic or in this situation like many, many years ago. I am a former electronic engineer and I used to work for the telecom industry. And, and in, the, in parallel, I used to be volunteer for different programs with people with different kind of disabilities. And I start to realize how much I was learning from my interaction with these people with disabilities that I could uh, incorporate in my daily work, right? Because, you know, uh, being a woman in a mainly men environment in telecommunications Mexico was like, how do I make my team uh, to grow and to have better results as a team, right? So I I I saw that uh, learning from uh, this difference in, on disability was giving me well, of course, uh, very good ideas and and, and different approach. So then I decided to quit this uh, telecommunications career and start Lincoln in 2012. Of course, it was after a personal, uh, you know, decision, lots of, uh, like, question myself what exactly I wanted to do. So I decided to start in Kenya, which is a company focused on um, disability consultants. consultancy. And what we uh, mainly do there is to help companies in Mexico to uh, um, to really realize the um, the value of uh, inclusion in their work environment. We want to foster a new culture among the companies uh, to show them that uh, all the diversity that they already have and the diversity that they can bring to their organization can be really powerful in nowadays to uh, to to um, foster innovation within the company, right? To make a team collaborate better, right? And to do uh, um, to have new talents into the organization. So that's what we have been doing for the last two years and a half, and really has been for me it's a lesson every day, you know. I think uh, uh, really focus on the positive of difference, it's a daily work, yeah, you know, because we come from another uh, education, right? World has been educated like to exclude, right? To what I don't like is better not to talk about, right? And I, and I believe we need to change our mindset. And of course, it's, um, as I said, it's a daily, daily world. You need to start thinking, okay, it's different. Probably I don't like it at the first time, but then what have positive to bring to me? What can I learn from that person? What can I learn uh, from uh, his different or her different approach of life or the way he's interacting or, or conducting? And, um, and disability, and I start from, from the disability world because we have disability in every country, different nations, different, you know, ways of thinking. Uh, so that's why we are, um, I think that uh, the best way to understand diversity is through inclusion, right? To really learn, including people with disabilities, lead us to be able to include all the diversity. Okay, that that sounds that's a fascinating endeavor. How are you finding the uptake? Are you finding that it's small organizations or, or, or big big 
telecoms and, and large organizations that are, are really engaging on this matter, or is it a mixture of, 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 of all of them? I think it's a, mainly a mixture, but we have been working with uh, large companies, like for example, one of the largest airport companies in the south of Mexico is one of our customers. We have been giving them um, workshops about inclusion and disability inclusion to foster a better services for customers, right? Because they know that in their airport daily there are people with disabilities, probably permanent or just temporal, <coughs> that are going to their efforts, right? So we work with this company and they are really uh, willing to foster this culture and employees in the company. And also we did uh, an accessibility assessment that in, in the next years of their investment, they will be, you know, renewing uh, facilities and everything to foster, to foster accessibility. So we have been doing with this great companies, other large companies, but also small companies, small companies. I can tell you one of our uh, smaller customers was a family, a family who, who called us and said, listen, my grandmom lost her view due to uh, illness, you know, diabetics. And uh, the last year had been like really harmful for us because we don't know how to interact with her, how to help her, right? So they pay us for a consultant, uh, a training of two hours, right, to discuss with 15 members of the family how to better interact with uh, their grandma, right? That's great. I love that. That's, that's fantastic. Deborah, I know you've got a question for, for Lourdes. Yes, I am. Um, Lourdes, welcome to Access Chat. We are really excited to have you on. Um, I, Lourdes and I have known each other several years now, and um, I know that you're focused on, like, like all of us, disability inclusion and also ICT accessibility. And do you see, um, we, l last week we had Paola on here on Access Chat from Columbia, and we just see a lot of innovations coming from our Latin countries. And so um, what it, what's happening in Mexico? Because there seems to be a lot of conversations about inclusion, and I know you're right in the middle of them, but you know, what do you think you know, we can expect from Mexico over the next few years in regards to these issues? Yeah, well, I am sure that uh, it, there's gonna be like, a, it, there, is, there has been and there's gonna be more and more changes on the legislation in this country that are going to help to foster inclusion. Because uh, uh, even though Mexico signed the convention in 2007, we still have uh, some challenge uh, according to the actual legislation, right, that allows to foster inclusion. So, for example, this year there was a new telecommunications law that is actually improving uh, and fostering uh, accessible uh, technologies, right? And um, also for next year, we are expecting, it's not uh, like quite confirmed, but we're expecting that there will be a quote, like a percentage that a public, mm -hmm. public institutions will have to fulfill with people with disability working in their in these institutions, right? So, yeah, yeah, quota, yeah. So I think uh, these changes are gonna help to grow, uh, to grow the inclusion in our country. Uh, Lourdes, um, one thing that um, I saw, I, I wrote a book on employability that's going to finally pu publish, I believe, in December. And we had, uh, because of uh, one of Neil's colleagues, uh, I had a big discussion with Sco Susan Scott Parker of, uh, about quotas. And do we see when countries have quotas? that include people with, you know, that, you know, so that people with disabilities can be included in the workforce, are they working? And one country that um, we saw that it was not working and it was uh, not a good best practice was France. 
and France has had a quota for many years and, and the corporations, the employers were just paying the fines because they really just did not know how to successfully employ people with disabilities. And so then a few years ago, the government really started focusing on this and providing service providers and training and support to these employers. And now France is one of the best countries in the world as far as including people with disabilities. We, we were really, really surprised to see the success come from the French employers. And um, I know that ATOS happens to be a French employer, but they're located all over the world. But it has been um, a really interesting turnaround. And so um, if we can see more countries follow the direction of what we saw from the French employers, I think quotas um, maybe can be seen more successfully. So. Um, so we we're, we but we have seen some very interesting things coming from this recent stuff in France. Of course, got lots of work to do. I get that, but um, it's still very interesting statistics. So we're um, hopefully we'll see that happen in Mexico. Yeah, actually, Deborah, if 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 I can tell you, I am not uh, I am not like a very fan of quota because I really think uh, what we need to do is to change the culture, right? The culture okay. in the company. And that's why our mission in Infinium is to create a new, <clears throat> um, new enterprise culture, right? And because we need to change our mindsets as, uh, as companies and understand what really diversity brings, uh, the value that diversity brings to the company is through inclusion. Because many years, different companies, you know, for, for, actually companies worldwide that are established worldwide, they have raised awareness about diversity, right? You know, like women and uh, people with disabilities and other groups, right? But there is not like inclusion, right? There is not like really people feel part and, uh, of the company that really feel part of a team, right? Really that their ideas are considered. That's what inclusion brings to the table, right? That's, I think, what's missing when we're talking only about diversity. I yeah, agree, I, but I, I would say, I would just note that what we're seeing when we looked at it from a global perspective is that countries that do have quotas and the service and the the, the um, service provider support are being more successful. I know in the United States, we just added a goal of seven percent, and a lot of the companies that were not taking it seriously now have entered the conversation. So there seems to be some kind of blended approach. Uh, excuse me, Neil, I accidentally interrupted you. That's all right. Um, so I, I'm with you, daughters. I do think that there is a it's a double-edged sword when it comes to quotas because people see quotas as being an enforcement mechanism yeah. and enforcement doesn't necessarily um, get associated in people's minds with efficiency, uh, innovation and all of the things that we're talking about. So I think it's really important to, to focus on the positives, look at what diversity can do in terms of linking that positively to your bottom line and that's something that within Atos we're we're trying to do right now is actually our diversity program is linking um, diversity and, and that includes disability inclusion to our productivity and performance we see it as a key performance indicator for the organization that we've become more diverse and, and support uh, all of our diversity initiatives to help support the company grow uh, rather than see it as a target to be met yeah. um, it's an arbitrary thing uh, I, I, I actually think that, that um, there is an issue also with um, the idea of quotas because there is a tendency for people to meet quotas by going to sheltered workshops yeah. uh, and, and that's not enabling people to have careers and, and what we want in, in an inclusive workplace is actually to enable people to have a great career path and prospects and the ability to to progress and shine and, and, and be able to contribute to a company. Yeah, I think Nell and Deborah, that's 
uh, that we all want, right? And and as uh, and I agree that it's a blended approach because it's diversity, right? So uh, yes. you have many possibilities, but the thing is that not to lose the, that the key for diversity is inclusion, right? Not exclusion, because we have been excluding diversity, and what we need to right. to build now it's an inclusive. Uh, society right where we where we celebrate difference where we uh, take advantage of difference right and uh, of course uh, we are talking of uh, a change of cultures uh, uh, not only in the companies in the schools in the government and every way we legislate right so that's that's what I think and I think Mexico is part of that uh, uh, that path right is following that path probably is taking us longer than other countries but uh, i i am happy that, that we started right to on this path and in in my personal uh, situation while well, lincoln had started like three years and a half ago and we look forward to keep uh, helping companies to to foster all all this new culture and of course to enhance accessibility because also when we talk about physical access accessibility uh, some things sometimes we think that are only for people with disability but I always tell them accessibility is for everyone right because we are all going to become old uh, older people right old people and we don't know how we will reach that age and what kind of uh, help we will be needing right Our, and we don't need to be all. What about a mom with a kid, right? That is walking uh, on the streets. Is there enough space for they both to walk safely? Not in all the streets in Mexico, I can assure you that, right? So, yeah. Um, uh, we are we are talking about you know bringing bringing uh, accessibility to to areas of business. How do you, what is you think is the role of government here? You know, can you provide us a few examples about the how this fits into into uh, into the Mexican government and what initiatives are they rolling out to themselves to make sure that they are also accessible in in the country as large as Mexico is. Well, I think, he, of course, government plays a key role, right? But it's not the only player, right? Society, we need to play our role as well. Companies, we need to play our role as well. But on the government side, I think there's still a lack of uh, communication aim on different programs and areas, right? We, we need to really bring a culture of inclusion within the government to ensure that they really uh, um, do new legislations always with an inclusion vision. And I want to give you an example, right? Uh, in Mexico City, what, what we have seen is like, uh, for example, I, I had a, like one year or two years ago, <laughs> I have a, a conversation with someone from the um, construction industry, you know, that they, they construct uh, houses, right? And I said, listen, you should like, you probably could like uh, create 10% of your new houses with accessibility, right? Or probably 7%, but always think like part of your houses will have good accessibility. And they answer me, well, you know, if the government allows to build a house of 120, 120 square meters with a base of 40, 40 square meters, right? How, how will we will think about accessibility, right? Because the legislation two years ago was that you can build, if you want to build a 100,000 square meters department in Mexico City, you can build in 40, in a base of 40 uh, square meters and then three floors, right? Because to have the 120 20 square meters, you see? So how do you build accessibility there if you're gonna have three in one apartment? Oh, well, that's where architecture comes in. And we, we, we've discussed architecture before on Access Chat and, 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 and actually, 
architecture is one of the, the few disciplines that's actually quite mature in terms of accessibility. Certainly in um, Western Europe, uh, accessibility um, in the building design has been part of the curriculum for many years now. So the, the problem that we have in, in, in many of these countries is that actually the developers don't use architects. They just use template designs and they're making these little houses and, 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 and pushing them out. So if we were to apply better architecture and give away um, these designs, and, and some architects are actually giving away their, their designs, we could have developers making accessible buildings almost by default because they, they just follow a template. So if you give them a good enough template, they'll follow it. Yeah, but um, this is part of, uh, yeah, Neil, I agree with you, but this is part of the legislation because the government should put, like, yes, text, no, it will allow you 40, 40 square meters, but you have to, you have to build 10% of the houses with accessibility, right? Like something yeah. like that, right? Not, not 100%, but thinking with an inclusive perspective. That's what I think is still missing on the, on the persons who are in the, in the government, right? Some of them are, are bringing into the table. I know that in this actual uh, government, and actually the previous government we had, they started thinking about this, right? And it's, it's still a long uh, path to go but uh, unfortunately, there are some already look willing to work on, on this path, but they're still missing this. There is still this misconnection, right? Okay. Deborah, you had a, uh, a point you wanted to raise, I believe. Well, the, the, the two, two quick points. Um, I know that in the future on Access Chat, we're going to have um, Maria Mendina, who is an architect that focuses on accessibility and innovation. She works um, in Madrid with the Olmste Foundation. I, I think their name is El Union now. So, and also, as you were saying, Lou, now that, I mean, because Mexico has signed and ratified the CRPD, the convention, um, all of the buildings and everything, the, you know, it is part, the built environment is very detailed in what they have to deliver. And of course, Mexico is more enlightened about this particular topic because the United States has still, still not ratified the convention, which is a sore point for me. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, we we signed it and we ratified, right? Ratified. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you ratified. Yeah. So we need to work on that direction. Yeah. Probably it's because I think we could work faster, and I sometimes I think they are working slow, but we are working, and of course we uh, in Lincoln, we want we are part of this because we definitely, we are strong believers that inclusion is like uh, the culture of the future. If we, because even as a business, if you want to uh, remain, to be successful in time, right? You need to keep incorporating new talent, new ideas, right? To innovate. And if you don't open your doors to inclusion of people with disabilities at work, how do, will you bring all these ideas and, and innovations that they can bring to your team, right? And also, even your team that is already in place won't feel, if, if they don't feel included, they don't bring new ideas, right? Great, thanks. So uh, we were, we were, you know, to, to, in, in, even in relation to to government, every day, you know, today we all have this type of devices with us. You know, a lot of people have <laughs> more, have mobiles. Yes, you are here, and and uh, is one of the main ways that that uh, citizens can uh, interact with government. So uh, if I wa if I want to access to some type of services from from the government, I could do them on my phone. I don't have to go to a physical location. So that's something yes. that I would like to, to know about. What is the current scenario in Mexico? How can uh, citizens ac access to government services using uh, mobile devices? And because in some areas this could be a, a, a very a good initiative in terms of cost saving solutions for people with, dis with, with, with disabilities. Yeah. 
actually since the past uh, administration, right, the, the previous government and the actual government, they have been working with, you know, to make a web page accessible of, uh, of the government sites, but they are not in the point yet. But I know that more and more is like a must do for public uh, organizations, right, that belongs to government. They, they have to have their, to build their sites accessible. And again, it's, uh, it's another change of mindset because even to build documents, right, PDF documents, to build uh, uh, everything accessible, not all the people have this uh, idea, right? Because they don't even think that a blind people can use a computer, right? <laughs> so that's why yeah. they say, why should I do accessible? How are blind people will use the computer, right? So you need to most trade them. No, and I'm talking about the device, Antonio. Actually, yes, in, it's one thing we always bring to the table in our workshops is how accessible are already our uh, smartphones, right? Because most of the people who have, who have a smartphone has accessibility functions, but very few people knows about this, right? And uh, it's, uh, again, it's something that we need to spread this culture, to use the functions, to show them how they can benefit from these functions of accessibility. It's not only for blind people, right? So what type of work, no, absolutely. What, what type of work you think is, is being done at university level uh, in terms of accessibility? How, how, what, uh, what has been the role of universities here? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, in the National University of Mexico, which is the largest one, there's still a lot of things to do, even in the physical accessibility, not talking about technology, right? They are, they are still, I think, uh, they still need have, uh, to do some changes, right? Uh, even if they have already like a, a focus on uh, students with disability, but they're still, they need to work out on the physical and technical accessibility. They have a very good center in Mexico City, but it's just like one among all the uh, largest uh, units of this university. And that's from the National University, is the, is the, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you. I need to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I, I, let, 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 let me let me complete this 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 here. So let's say if you have a, a, a university student in in the in the university in, in any university in Mexico, when they apply and when they are completing their studies, can we say that they are at the same level than any other student in terms of the way how they are able to access to the curriculum and to do their own, the tasks that are expected from them? When, when leaving the university, yes, I think so. I think so. I, uh, the problem is that the difficulty they have to go into the university, right? Because not all the universities are accessible yet, right? And not all the teachers are accessible to have students with disabilities. And there is another university in the north of the country that has been working hardly on accessibility and actually many students with disability that of course have have the money and the resources they are going to the north of the of the country to study there because they know that this like for example this university as far as i understand because i have not been there yet but as far as i understand most of the professors have resigned sign language uh, training right so they can okay. uh, they can have conversations and and um, and on sign language Mexican sign language for example right and other different things of accessibility so so I think also is something missing there's private com uh, universities working on their accessibility but some of them are going slow slower that 
others. And again, because this is this is like a, a one step after the other, right? When you arrive to a company and you tell them do uh, inclusion at work, they tell you yes, but where where do I find a, a person with the diploma I, I am looking for, right? And the thing is that uh, not all the people with disabilities in Mexico are, are still having access to the university, right? So you need access to the university to create the pipeline of talent into companies to then up the game. And, and all of these things are long term. I've got one final question before we close. We've got a couple of minutes. And, and that is, what is the thing that's most exciting you over the next couple of years? So what is it that's in, in Mexico that is most exciting in terms of prospects for including more people? Um, so, you say like what? What was one of the projects where we saw more? Well, and it, what is the what is the most exciting thing that you can see on the the horizon that's going to make a difference? Okay, okay. Well, I think uh, I see two things. It's uh, of course legislation changes, right? That are going to foster this inclusion. And also, I see more organization of the social uh, organizations, right, that work with people with disabilities. They start like really do more team work, right, in order to ensure that they provide companies with uh, with the persons with the abilities required by the companies, right. So I see these two things like. Uh, fostering inclusion in the next years. Uh, physical accessibility because, um, yeah, physical accessibility is like, uh, for example, in the working uh, law, uh, nowadays, if you are a company with more than 50 employees, you need to have at least one accessible area for people with disabilities to work with you. Of course, okay. since this is not like being reviewed yet, some companies are doing, some companies haven't done yet, right? But it's already in the law. So when they will come, you know, with this, uh, with when you will have to change to pay a fee if you don't accomplish that, probably the changes will go faster. I don't know, right? But uh, yes, uh, as a uh, I think one thing also Mexico is partnering with all other organizations around the world, right? Is uh, like uh, like the um, with the G3 ICT, as Debra mentioned. I think it's uh, uh, for me was a great opportunity participating. Thanks to Debra last year in the G3 ICT uh, at the M Enabling Summit last year was really great to learn uh, uh, everything about accessible technology. So we need to spread that in Mexico as well. We, we, see, we are working, like working with you today and having this conversation for me is like uh, uh, through, through our social network spreading in Mexico these uh, possibilities, right? And I think it, it, um, it's also, a, a, a good thing to start learning from what has been already done. We not we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to produce it better, right? To give to bring our approach to 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 do it better. <laughs> agree. Neil, Neil, agree. We don't have you. Are you mute? Thank you very much. You know, we reached the end of our half hour, so you've been a great guest and uh, we look forward to chatting with you on Twitter. Thank you, guys. Really glad to uh, talk to you as well and look forward to keep uh, interacting in the future. Okay. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, look forward to it.